Hi, um, so I am Jane Wagstar and I am a support scientist in the NMR facility here at the LMB. What we want you to take away from this is really how you can apply NMR to your structural biology projects. So I'm going to be talking to you today for hopefully less than an hour about the kind of samples that we like for our experiments, molecular dynamics, because I'm going to talk about this a lot. I think this is a really strong feature of the of NMR and how it can, add, as I say, add value to your projects. And I'm going to give you some case studies of work that we've done in collaboration with labs in the LMB. So to give you a flavour of the kind of experiments that we can do, the kind of information we can give you. So just think about what I'm saying during my talk and your project and see if there's some kind of overlap. There's some question that you have you can use NMR to, to help answer your specific biological question. So down the bottom here, you can see this is a picture of our NMR facility. We're not in the main LMB building. We're actually about a five minute walk away by car park one on campus. And, you know, if you are interested in doing NMR with us, please contact Stefan Freund. He's the head of the facility and all of our contact details are on our internal web pages. I think it's really important to say here that NMR spectroscopy isn't a one experiment, one answer technique. We can actually do lots of different experiments that really probe lots of different structural biology aspects. Um, we, I'm going to talk to you today about protein NMR. That doesn't mean that um, in um, biological NMR is completely limited to proteins because you can look at nucleic acids, you can look at metabolomics. But today I'm going to be focusing on solution and solution protein NMR. And really there is a ideal size of protein that we can look at for your system. But that doesn't mean to say if you've got a bigger system, then we're not it's going to be able to tell you information. So typically, you know, we're looking at the smaller side of systems, 10, 20, 40 kilodaltons. But if you had a megadalton complex and you were looking at, say, binding interactions and things like that, that is accessible by NMR. And I'll talk to you in more detail about that later. NMR is residue specific. So here's a, just a schematic of a, a 15 NHSQC. So we get one cross peak for every backbone amide um, bond. And you can encode within this cross peak information about your system. So you can look at dynamics, you can look at the fold. That's really useful to have that residue specific information. Kind of information that's encoded, well, we can look at the three dimensional structure um, in NMR um, chemical shifts are uniquely sensitive in proteins to the um, the torsion angles, the, the secondary structure elements they're in. So with a few simple experiments, we can give you a readout of the secondary structure environment. And you know that's without doing a full formal solution structure calculation. You can look at interactions. So we can actually look at quite a broad range of KD here when we're talking about interactions. And you, we could, so we could actually do fitting to give you to give you that binding information. But also what's really great is because it's residue specific, we can give you a binding interface as well and you know your proteins aren't static stationary things they are moving in solution and their movements their motions are really important for their function so and an nmr has a has can look at a broad range of time scales of motion if it was a folding event that happens on the seconds to minute time scale or you might have um, domain domain motion on the micro to millisecond time scale, um, even side chain motion on the picosecond time scale. That's all encompassing for our NMR experiments. We can access those kind of motions. And really, NMR is a very complementary technique. We like to think we sit in the interface between formal structure determination like crystallography and cryo EM and biophysical techniques. So we like to think we're a really integrated structural biology technique. Quick overview of the talk today. So I'm going to talk to you about kind of samples we can look at. Then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about dynamics of proteins, because I've already said that's really interesting by NMR. And then I'll go through these worked examples of published work from the facility. So samples and the molecular weight range. Well, if you had a smaller system, like a peptide, 10 kilodaltons, 
um, you might be able to order that um, from a peptide synthesis company, or you might be able to recombinantly express it. We wouldn't necessarily ask you to do any isotopic enrichment. We could look at any structure. We could look at the dynamics. The bigger the system, we're going to be asking you to isotopically enrich your system so we can look at other nuclei. So we want 15N and 13C. We could look at this structure. We could look at the secondary structure elements. We can look at binding studies, um, functional studies, dynamics, all that kind of thing between 20 to 30 kilodaltons. When it's that bit, when it's a bit bigger, 40 kilodaltons, we might ask you to deuterate. So we would replace the, the non-exchangeable protons with deuterium. That really helps our experiments. And as I said before, if you've got a bigger system, we couldn't do all of those things like a full structural determination. But if you had specific questions, like you're looking at binding interface, there were flexible loops that were important in your interaction. You could go for specific labeling, segmental labeling, um, say as in teams, or you could do methyl trozy um, experiments with your methyls 13C labeled. So we could get some specific site specific interaction. So say the smaller the system, we can give you a more complete picture. The bigger the system, we're looking at more um, site-specific in, in information. So this is true for bolded systems, but more and more we're looking at systems with intrinsically disorder, intrinsic disorder, so intrinsically disordered proteins or intrinsically disordered regions of proteins. And that can look quite different in terms of the structure. So you wouldn't really be able to study this in another way. You can do this by crystallography or cryo-EM but we can look at in um, IDPs by NMR. We can pick out any preference for secondary structure and we can look at the dynamic motions because you think, you know, the an IDP, IDP has a much more of an ensemble of motion than you would necessarily get with a folded protein. And for those systems, you know, we can look at systems that are up to 40 kilodaltons in size. We can look at the dynamics, we can look at binding interactions, post-translational modifications, any residual structure. We'd use our standard experiments, but also carbon detect experiments. I'm going to talk about the standard experiments in a little bit. Um, we wouldn't necessarily need you to deuterate, but 15N and 30C labeling is very helpful for looking at these IDP systems. And I'm going to talk to you about an IDP project in the second half of the talk. The protein fingerprint, our HSQC, this is actually a really useful initial look at your system, at your protein, because it can tell us a lot without actually having to know, have, having to have an assignment. So all the information that's encoded in our peaks can tell you about the local environment of that residue. So if you've got lots of distribution in the same mice proton dimension, that can tell us that your system is folded. And the line shape can tell you about whether your whether that particular residue is in a very flexible region because it's got these very sharp peaks or if it's in a say a loop that has more of a slow um, conformation exchange and you get line broadening as they eat the um, NMR nuclei are very sensitive to their local environment and that gives you this instant information if we can assign those peaks you can then transfer that information onto your structure if you had one so how do we do that assignment? So just very briefly, this is another schematic. This is our 2D HSQC, um, 15N HSQC, and you can see you get one cross peak for every um, proton bound for nitrogen of the backbone. You don't get a cross peak for proteins because they don't have a backbone proton. Um, and then we would typically collect three pairs of triple resonance experiments to get our assignment. So the first three experiments, are called the HMCO, HMCOCA and HMCOCACB. And they give you a third dimension, a carbon shift. And in this case, it would give you the uh, a cross peak that correlates the 15 and nitrogen with its proton and the preceding carbonyl from the residue preceding it. So the carbonyl, the, the carbon alpha, and the carbon beta in those three experiments. And then the next three are the HNCACO, HNCA and HNCACB, and they give you both the preceding and the own carbonyl, C alpha and C beta. So now you've got three carbon resonances for your own peaks of your 15N peak, and you've got the three resonances 
for its preceding peak. So if you've got that together, you can start linking together the information for each peak. What's also really helpful is that certain amino acid types have specific chemical shift information in them. So glycines don't have a backbone C beta and they have a very specific C alpha shift. Alanine has a very distinct C beta shift, so does serine and threonine. So if we have our linked together sequences, um, chains of peaks, and we can look at our primary sequence and look for our unique shift environment, our unique residues, we can stick our joined together peaks into our primary sequence. And then we can then say, well, this peak is from serine six, for example. So samples, how do we want them? So if you um, make an isopoly enriched sample for us, you need to grow your protein recombinantly in minimal media. You can ask the kitchens here at the LMB to make that for you. And then you supplement that with 15 n ammonium chloride as the sole nitrogen source. And you can also add 13C glucose or deuterated 13C glucose as the sole carbon source to isopoly enrich the, the, the carbons. And then you could also then grow that mineral media in D2O to, to, to have all of the, pro the non-exchanging protons to be deuterons, if that's if it's a bigger system. And then the kind of sample we want, the purified sample at the end, where we would ideally like 550 microliters of your protein between 100 and 500 micromolar concentration in an aqueous buffer, a mid-range pH, but that will depend on the PI of your protein. And we just add 5% by volume of a deuterated solvent, it's like D2O, so the experiment, that helps our experiments work. And then just a sideline in terms of specific labeling you can do, so you don't have to uniformly label your your system. So here's a, a project we're working on with Christine Hilchenko from the CIMR. This is a uniformly labeled system, but if you have, if you supplement your growth media with specifically labeled 15 n labeled amino acids, you can then specifically label amino acid types. So that's what we've done with Christine. So you can see you, these are all the leucines labeled as isoleucines, leucines, tyrosines, valines, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're having trouble with your assignment, if you can specifically label amino acid type, that will really help. So dynamics. So in the first part of our NMR talks um, uh, last week, uh, this figure was shown. And I just want to reiterate again about how NMR can see lots of different dynamic processes or is as sensitive to the dynamic processes that's going on in, in the tube. So you might have um, what we call slow motion, so protein folding events, ligand binding, catalysis, segmental motion. We call these slow, they're like micro to milliseconds to seconds. They're slow motions relative to this figure, tau, this um, value tau c. Tau c is the tumbling time, it's the amount of time it takes your protein to move through one radiant in solution. And then we have fast motion. Um, side chain motion, mobility, we can pick up um, specific experiments to look at fast motion on that side. So um, I could say we have a, an, a window into a broad range of dynamic processes that are happening in the system. One of the simplest um, real, um, dynamic experiments we can collect to look at protein motion in your system is the heteronuclear renoin. So I'm showing an example here of a folded, uh, so it's a protein that has a folded C-terminus and a flexible N-terminus. And so red, the part of the protein that is folded has a positive heteronuclear NOE value around um, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and that's what we'd expect for a residue in a rigid environment. And if we look at our um, flexible um, N-terminus, you can see that the heteronuclear NOE values are are lower, um, even negative in places. And that just says that we're looking that, that the system is flexible on the peak a second time scale. But what's interesting is even though this end terminus is flexible, there are regions, islands of increased rigidity within that end terminus. So we can see here, we've got some heteronuclear enemy values that are a bit higher. And we do know that these residues are involved in downstream um, downstream ligand interactions. The two other really important NMR dynamics experiments are the longitudinal relaxation, T1, and transverse relaxation, T2. 
these are uh, these measurements are more complicated to dissect because they are influenced by motion that happens on different time scales. What's interesting about them in terms of our analysis is that behavior within the system influences the speed at which these events happen, these relaxation events happen. So for example, in the T1, that's um, really sensitive to the overall shape of your molecule. So whether it's isotropic or anisotropic, say you're looking at a um, coil coil, then the T1 information will reflect that anisotropy. And the T2 data is very sensitive to the overall size of your system. I really like this plot, this T2 against T1 plot, because I think it's a really nice way of showing you a, like a global picture of the dynamic processes. So this is T1, T2 of ubiquitin. And on the plot, we have some extra lines. So the red lines are for order parameter. And they're basically describing the rigidity of the residue. So the higher the order parameter, the more rigid the system. Um, and then these blue lines are describing this tau C, this tumbling time that we talked about earlier. So you can see for ubiquitin that um, each cross peak is from one residue. And you can see that they're all kind of clumping together here. So you've got basically one global correlation time for the system. Then you have outliers. And we know that these are from residues that are in flexible loops and the termini of ubiquitin. Um, so yes, we have one global correlation time with some flexibility on top. But if we look at a disorder system, so this is a, a pet IDP for the NMR community, alpha synuclein, you can see that um, there isn't this clumping together of, um, of, of, of the cross peaks for each residue. So we've got a broader distribution of correlation time. And I think this makes sense if you think about how a, a IDP tumbles in solution. There isn't just one global correlation time. And you can see if you compare it to the order parameter, it's much more flexible. And that's because, you know, your system doesn't have this one global correlation time. It has lots of individual correlation times. It's much more sensitive to local motion in terms of its relaxation properties. What's a really quick practical application of a T2 data set? Well, this was uh, just a quick story from Chris Dowes, who's in, who was in the MODIS group and the university wing here at the LMB. Um, he had a protein called Taser that has a PARP-like um, protein fold, and he wanted to crystallize it, but he wasn't able to do so. So he expressed it recombinantly with 15N, HST, uh, 15N and 13C isotopic enrichment. The assignment was done and the T, this T2 was collected, and you can see that there's this particular region here with high T2 values. So that's probably from a flexible loop. So Chris was able to truncate that loop out, which was uh, um, down here. And then he was then able to crystallize it. And there he has this crystal structure of, the, of his PARP-like um, protein taser. Let's talk about some examples, some worked examples of um, NMR projects from the facility. And we're going to talk about ubiquitination. Um, so this was a part of a very fruitful collaboration that we had with the Commander Lab when it was still here at the LMB. Um, and some of this work is a little bit old now, but I think this is a really nice example of how NMR can give you lots of different experiments to give you lots of different answers about what's going on in your system. So a quick overview about ubiquitin. So it's a highly conserved protein um, involved uh, in post-translational modifications. You can have multiple chain types of ubiquitin because ubiquitin can be joined from its C terminus to these various lysine molecules in, in ubiquitin or also at, the, um, at its uh, um, N terminus. And the multiple chain permutations give um, ubiquitin signals multiple functions downstream. So these multiple functions include things like endocytosis, um, innate immunity, degradation by the proteasome. But um, Toby in the commander lab, was a PhD student who started this, was interested in the role of ubiquitin in mitophagy. So very quickly, um, mitophagy in ubiquitin. So what happens normally in a healthy mitochondria is this kinase pink is cycled in and out of the membrane if there's nothing going on. But if you get a depolarization event in the mitochondrial membrane, 
then pink becomes resident. It can phosphorylate itself. Um, it can then start to phosphorylate the um, parkin, and then parkin um, will then become ubiquitinated. That ubiquitin chain will also become phosphorylated, and then this will this ubiquitin chain will then target the um, broken um, mitochondria for degradation by phagocytosis. Why is um, this an interesting system? Well, um, there are mutations in the ubiquitin lig um, E3 ligase Parkin that have been identified in early onset Parkinson's disease. And this is just um, some of the mutations that have been identified um, mapped onto the Parkin structure. So as I said, um, Parkin is activated by pink. Parkin has a UBL. A UBL is a ubiquitin-like domain, and in this case, it's essentially ubiquitin as the first domain of Parkin. Um, and that's where um, pink phosphorylates, phosphorylates at serine 65 of the UBL. But um, pink can also phosphorylate um, monodispersed ubiquitin. And the phosphorylated ubiquitin can activate Parkin. So Toby wanted to know what the consequences were of phosphorylation of ubiquitin at serine 65. So let's have a think about what we would see if we were going to ubiquitinate serine 65. So we can do phosphorylation in situ, and that's what I'm showing you here. So you need all of your components for phosphorylation in the tube. That's our target residue, serine 65. And as time progresses, we can see what happens to that peak. So when the phosphorylation starts to happen, we start to get a second peak for the phosphoserine. And then the intensity of our um, original serine peak starts to reduce to get to the point where the serine 65 has disappeared and we only have a peak for the phosphorylated serine 65. So let's do this in real life. Here's wild type ubiquitin. And I'll just point out to you here, here's our serine 65 residue. So we have a time course of phosphorylation. And then we can see over time, we can do one HSQC about every seven minutes here. We can see our serine 65 is disappearing. We've got extra peaks appearing because of that change in environment. And so we get to the end. We can see serine 65 has completely disappeared, which is what we'd expect. But interestingly, we actually have 60 extra peaks. We didn't really understand what was going on here because you should lose one peak and gain another peak. So. And we use NMR to work out what's going on. So again, here's our wild type ubiquitin, and here's our phosphorylated spectrum. And you can kind of see here that the, the sub, there's a subset of peaks in the phosphorylated ubiquitin that match up quite nicely with our wild type. But then we have these additional peaks that are really in quite a different chemical environment. So can we work out what kind of system that belongs to? So there we were able to um, do an assignment because the protein was double labeled and you can assign this major species, which was about 70% of the population by peak intensity. And that matches up very well with um, wild type ubiquitin. And then about 30% of the sample was what we call this minor species. And these peaks for the um, for ubiquitin were in quite a different location compared to the wild type system. And um, here's another way of showing it. So here we've got the wild type um, in red, we've got our major species in dark blue and our minor species in light blue. And if we look at the relative peak positions with our chemical shift perturbation map, you can see that when you compare wild type ubiquitin with the phosphorylated major species, then you get chemical shift perturbations around the phosphorylation site. And that makes a lot of sense because that um, phos um, phosphorylated serine has a different chemical environment. But what was really interesting is if you compare the wild type ubiquitin with the phosphorylated ubiquitin minor species, then you've got really large changes in the um, chemical shift perturbation map, especially at this C terminus. So can we see any obvious structural differences from our data? Well, as I said before, um, you can encode portion angle information into the into our triple resonance data and we can see that essentially the minor and the major species 
are have the same overall architecture, maybe just a slight extension in the minor species of this um, C terminal um, beta sheet. Toby was able to crystallize phosphorylated ubiquitin, and really the, the crystal structure is almost identical to wild type ubiquitin. There's just this big patch of negative charge from the phosphorylated serine here. So that's not really telling us about this minor species. We can look at the dynamics of the of this these two states. So here we're looking at our heteronuclear NOE data for phosphorylated ubiquitin. And you can see the only real difference seems to be in this C terminus, where the major species is more flexible than the minor species. So what could be happening? Toby was only able to crystallize one species, which suggests to us that it might be that the major and minor species were in some kind of confirmation exchange. And can we probe that? We can with an experiment called ZZ exchange, which is a bit like a normal HSQC, except you build in a delay time that allows exchange of magnetization from the major to the minor species. So if they were exchanging, you'd get an extra cross peak. And indeed, we do see that here. So here's for our Q62, a cross peak that joins together the two species. And if we vary this delay time, we can fit the exchange rate. And we found out that um, indeed they are exchanging between each other at a rate of about twice a second. So what is the distinct structural difference between the major and the minor species? And we can look at that by um, examining the hydrogen bonding network, because one, one clue we had about the structure of the minor species is that you have really large chemical shift differences in the proton dimension. And that was indicative that there might be a change in the hydrogen bonding network. So I've talked earlier about the HNCO, which correlates the NH with its preceding carbonyl. And if you think about a hydrogen bond, it's a similar kind of connection. It's just over a longer distance. So we can have a modified HNCO experiment with a long range HNCO. And this is what I'm showing you here. So if you think about what we're looking at, so this is three dimensional data squashed down into a 2D plane. So along the bottom, we have our proton chemical shift. And then up the side, we have our carbon chemical shift, in this case, the carbonyl data. And then through the plane of the board, we would have our 15N shift. So over here in a, HSQ, in a HNCO, we have a correlation between isoleucine 44 NH and the preceding carbonyl. But in the long range HNCO, you um, get a correlation between the isoleucine 44 NH and uh, through the hydrogen bond to the histidine 68 CO. So that's what you would expect to see in wild type ubiquitin. It's what we see in the major species. In the minor species, we don't see a correlation between that 44 and 68. Instead, we see a correlation between 44 and 70, which means that hydrogen bond has shifted by two res residues in register. N of our spectroscopists really um, love ubiquitin. It's a really good model system. And a lot of um, experiments were developed on ubiquitin. I mean, we're not into method development, but we are looking, we are experimentalists. We're looking at answering biological questions. It's really nice that we know a lot of experiments that were developed on ubiquitin will work to help us answer these biological questions. So as I say, this, this experiment, this long range HNCO was developed with ubiquitin. So we have the pattern of hydrogen bonding network that you would expect in ubiquitin. You then, we compared, we did this experiment with our major species. So the, the, the bonds are the same essentially. With our phospho ubiquitin, we can see we have this shift in register. So the, um, this C terminal, um, uh, sheet um, strand has been retracted into the core of the protein by two residues. We can show this in an animation. And I think you can see how so this, this retraction is possible because of this leucine, X leucine, X leucine sequence, which allows those um, leucine side chains to move in the different pockets of, of the core of ubiquitin. And you know, we can confirm this um, change in register with more traditional NMR experiments. Another thing we can think about is solvent accessibility of our 
system. So again, this is ubiquitin, and what I've highlighted here is um, backbone amide protons in red that could freely exchange with the bulk solvent and then green residues that are protected either because they're buried in the core or they're part of the hydrogen bonding network. And we can think about how um, hydrogen or a proton exchange can be influenced by the kind of motions that are happening in, uh, in, the, in the system. So you might have heard of hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. That's looking at the slower motions, and you can also do that by NMR. So you're looking at processes that happen on the seconds time scale. But what I'm talking about here in solvent exchange is much faster. So we're talking about millisecond time scale that can um, inform you of things about ligand binding and segment motion, et cetera. And then um, in the solvent accessibility experiments, we can actually fit the data and we can um, look at solvent exchange, basically that's happening between two and 40 times a second. And we can apply this to our phosphoubiquitin spectrum. So here's our HSQC. And then our solvent exchange experiment is called Kleenex. And you can see which residues can exchange with the solvent. And if we look at our favorite Q62 peak, you can see in the minor species um, that the it's exchanging more with the solvent, but in the major species, it's protected. The same is true for K63 and E64. So I think this is a really neat way of showing how that loop coming in and out as part of the retraction is protecting those residues or exposing those residues to solvent exchange. So what do we know so far? We know that when you phosphorylate pink, phosphorylate ubiquitin using pink, then phosphorylate ubiquitin exchanges between these two states. And we've been able to determine that. But another question that the command lab had was well, if this exchange of states can happen in wild type in wild type phosphorylated ubiquitin, can it happen in unphosphorylated ubiquitin? If it was happening, the exchange rate would must be um, uh, the 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 population of that exchange state must be very low because ubiquitin has been heavily studied and no one had ever spotted it before. But that doesn't mean we can't do experiments to see if it was the case. So we can look at um, exchange in an invisible to an invisible state with an experiment called um, chemical exchange saturation transfer. It was really developed for the MRI field, but you can apply it to solution NMR. And you need certain conditions for this experiment to work. So you need an invisible state, so state that you wouldn't necessarily be able to see in your HSQC, a population of one percent or less, and it has to be exchanging within the certain kind of um, exchange rate, so between 20 and 300 times a second. And the other thing it needs is the um, invisible state to have a different chemical environment so that you can tell the difference between the invisible and the visible states. So we know that if this was happening for ubiquitin, then we would have this alternative different um, chemical shift because we know the environments would be quite different. And how does it work? So um, saturation transfer is basically, it's a sat it needs a saturation pulse. And the saturation pulse in this case reduces the signal intensity of the peak. So if we apply a saturation pulse to specific nitrogen frequencies, so here for our Q62 peak, we can sweep through our saturation pulse across discrete nitrogen frequencies. When it hits our Q62, our peak intensity drops. Then if you think about what would happen in a system where you hit our invisible state, then that's, that signal will be saturated. But if there's exchange between the two states, then that saturation will be transferred back to the visible state. So here we go. We've got our Q62 peak. We hit it with our saturation. The signal intensity is reduced. Then it recovers. Then we hit our invisible state. It's reduced somewhat and then recovers. So we collect this um, data as a pseudo 3D. So we have our 2D HSQC. And in our third dimension, we have our swept 15 and nitrogen saturation pulse. And here's our favorite for Q62. And here's our data. So indeed, when we get to our Q62, 
nitrogen um, frequency, we suppress the peak intensity. And then as we sweep further up into the spectrum, we have another region of suppressed signal intensity. You wouldn't normally look at CES data like this. It's normally plotted like this as a reciprocal of peak intensity change. And we can fit this data again. And we were able to say, indeed, yes, wild type ubiquitin has this invisible state and it's exchanging at a rate of about 60 times a second and the population is about 0.7 about percent um now why was this not seen before can i say ubiquitin's been heavily studied and it's really down to the temperature of the experiment so at 25 degrees you can see that there isn't any evidence of this second state but as you increase the temperature the second state becomes more visible we had a feeling this would be the case because if you take your phosphorylated ubiquitin and increase the temperature of the of the data collection you see a shift from the major species to the an increase in population of the minor species but is this invisible state the retractive confirmation so you can look at various different peaks and compare the retracted state um, with the cess data from our phosphorylated data and the cess data for the wild type and you can look to see if you get matches up in the secondary in the in the shift information well things don't match up beautifully but then that's good because you wouldn't necessarily expect them to because you've got that phosphorylated serine it's got a different chemical environment so it will affect the chemical shift but if we look at the overall pattern of the invisible state shift differences and compare that with the HSQ shift differences of the wild type ubiquitin, we can say, yes, we do have this retracted confirmation in ubiquitin. And um, Alex and Christina, who um, were part of this project, developed mutants to um, recapitulate the, structural, the structure of the um, retracted form without the need for phosphorylation, so this TVLN mutant, and then there's also this L71Y wild type lock that can't retract. And then if you think about our phosphorylation time course that we had at the beginning, you can do the same thing again, this time with our mutants. And you can see very interestingly, so this is our wild type phosphorylation curve. And when you're looking at our retracted mutant, that's phosphorylated much faster. And the wild type lock that can't retract its C terminus as well, that phosphorylation takes much longer. And that has, I mean, that has implications um, for um, how pink can phosphorylate. So um, Alex was able to use uh, the retracted C, um, retracted C terminal um, com, uh, mutant of ubiquitin with a nanobody and pink to crystallize this and see that indeed, because the active site of pink is quite buried into the core, you need to be able to retract that C, C terminus to pull out the loop in order to have efficient phosphorylation of ubiquitin. So just to summarize that for you, so we're able to show you in situ phosphorylation of your system. We were able to look at the exchange between two forms and characterize them structurally. None of this information could have been got by crystallography, but was only accessible by, the, by our NMR experiments. We're also able to identify in the invisible confirmation of wild type ubiquitin and quantify it, and also show that the retracted confirmation is required for pink phosphorylation. So in the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes, I want to move on to a new story. Um, this is work that we've done with Sophia Lovestam, and she's from um, the Sherez and Goddard groups here at the LMB. And we're looking here specifically at the structural propensity of disorder systems, namely tau. So I don't want to say too much about tau because I'm really not an expert, but just a quick summary. So tau is one of the proteins that's found in amyloid filaments in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, interestingly, there are multiple different structures of tau that seem to be found in different neurodegenerative diseases. Sophia was able to show during her PhD that if you very carefully control the experimental conditions, say the buffer, the temperature, the shaking, 
you can recapitulate the structure that's seen in disease brains with recombinant in, um, protein in vitro. During um, Sophia's experiment, she was looking at time-resolved formation of tau filaments and noticed this um, initial early stage filament formation. So it's, um, it, it's very different to the mature filament and it involves residues um, 302 to 316 of tau. And this particular interaction isn't seen in the mature, in the mature filaments in brains. And she, so it was called the first intermediate amyloid or the FIA. Um, and obviously I've said, this is, this is one of the, this is the first structure that was seen during the time resolved maturation of filaments um, and it's unique. And as Sophia did this wonderful experiment with all of these different time resolved prior end structure determinations. And again, I'm just showing you to summarize here um, that she did multiple structures and but both um, from the conditions that give you the PHF or the CTE fold of tau, they both start with this via filament. So you had this wonderful time resolved um, structural determination. But they were really interested to find out what's going on in monomeric tau that means this via forms in the first place. So they turned to us, the NMR, and we were looking at buffer conditions that were the same as Sophia had identified for CTE final filament confirmation. So that's a phosphate buffer with 150 millimolar salt and pH 7.4. And we collected our data at low temperature, and that really helps us with our data collection. You can see here that we've got very little dispersion in the proton dimension, and that's really typical of a disordered system. I assign the protein, and we can then, with our, with our chemical shift information, we can extract um, the backbone torsion angles, because that's sensitive in the carbon information, carbon chemical shift, and we can see that there are regions of of this tau construct that have a propensity to form an extended backbone. Normally, when we have a folded system that has beta sheets in them, we would have this wide dispersion in the proton dimension. We don't see that here because we're not seeing that hydrogen bonding network. That's where that dispersion comes from. But there's still a preferential orientation of the backbone into an extended conformation. So we also wanted to study tau dynamically to see if there's anything, any dynamic reason why these particular regions come together in, um, in the formation of the FIA. So we collected our standard um, experiments. We've got our um, T1, or here shown as R1, T2, and heteronuclear NOE. We can collect it at multiple fields. So here in our facility, we can let, collect 600 and 800 megahertz data, and we have access to high, high field spectroscopy at the Crick in London. So we could get 950 data. Um, there seem to be some correlation in the dynamic data between the residues that are um, part forming the FIA and our dynamics data. But I mean, we stare at dynamics data all the time and we can see this is interesting, but I think it's probably a bit esoteric and you need to be able to explain this um, to a more general audience. Um, it's a lot of data and it needs to be much easier to interpret. And to do that, we should probably try and move away from the raw dynamic data and dissect it into the, these multiple timescales of motion that I've spoken about that IDPs experience. So how can we do that? So we can look at the full, we can look at a broad dynamic landscape of the motions that are happening in our system by dissecting the spectral density. So you might find these um, equations familiar. They were, I showed them on our T1, T2 introduction at the beginning of the talk. And I said, you know, these relaxation events are governed by motions that happen on different frequencies. So when we collect 
this multiple experimental data, we can extract this frequency specific information. And if we have multiple, um, if we have multiple fields, we can increase the, the breadth of the frequencies that can be probed. And that's just what I'm showing you here. So when you have multiple field data, you can go from um, 600 to 950, and you can have a much better picture of the motion that's happening, um, the different timescales of motion that's happening. But I mean, that's still complex data set. So how can we distill that even more for you guys? So um, we look to the literature, there's this really nice paper from Fabian Farage's group from Paris, and they were interested in a protein. It's actually quite similar to our um, uh, folded system that I showed you earlier with the, H with the heteronuclear and data. But see, this system has a helical C terminus and a disordered N terminus, but it has regions of um, some structural dependency within that disordered region. And they collected a very extensive dynamic um, description of what was happening. So five fields of relaxation data, and then dissected that down into the spectral density analysis, which I'm showing you here. You can see, well, this is frequency um, that sampled in the kind of proton free motion that's in the proton frequency and then and the nitrogen frequency. That's how it's breaking down. Still, how do we how do we make that more digestible? And this is what um, the, the Farage group did. They developed this thing called impact, which is interpretation of motions by projection onto array of correlation times. So how do you do that? So basically you make a model, a matrix model that defines that dynamic, dynamic landscape. What you need to do, you need to identify the bounds of correlation times. So what's what the limits of the correlation time that you're describing so within this experiment you can set the bounds fast motion between one picosecond and one nanosecond or slower time scales between 100 picoseconds and 100 nanoseconds and that the the, the maximum correlation time is what's plotted on this axis and then you can divide that that breadth of correlation times into dis, into discrete numbers that best describe the motion that's happening. So it could be correlation times between say four and nine correlation times that best describe that landscape. Um, so this model selection is done by, forgive my pronunciation, AKEK information criterion. And that's what I'm showing you here. And you can think about this as a dynamic landscape. So the higher the value, like an energy folding landscape, the higher the value, the less likely that's, this, that's the right environment. And you have energy minima um, here um, where the information criterion is saying that this model best represents our collected data. Um, and so you can see for this um, NGRAIL2 system, there's sort of two minima, but, the, but the, the best model is for six correlation times about 26 nanoseconds as the maximum and 26 picoseconds is the, the fastest correlation time. Yeah. And then when you can then that AKEK um, information criterion that AIC is looking at the global protein um, value, then we can then extract our residue specific correlation time um and plot it against the prime uh, against the sequence number and i think you can see here that um at the c terminus there's one dominant correlation time that makes sense because you've got one folded system at the c terminus one folded region at c terminus and then in the flexible n terminus you've got a much broader range of correlation times that describe the motion that's happening and that matches up really nicely with the secondary structure um, information that we have for the system. So we can do that and apply it to our TAU sample. So throughout the project, we were, we were looking for examples or information that might suggest there's some kind of monomer dimer equilibrium going on in monodispersed TAU. We had some hints of it, but not anything strong enough to, to say formally that there's definitely monomer dimer equilibrium. We wanted to make sure that our 
structural information, our dynamic information wasn't um, biased by any exchange. So we collected slightly different experiments. I'm showing here ETA Z and ETA XY. These are exchange free experiments. We compared, compared um, we um, paired this with our heteronuclear NME data. And we can then extract our spectral density data like we saw with the NGREL2 and then complete the impact analysis on tau. Just to take a minute to look at this AIC plot, I think it's really interesting because it's very flat really, and I think that's probably not surprising. Tau doesn't spontaneously form these theta, you have to have certain conditions for things to happen. It's a super subtle effect that's happening. So you would probably not expect to have a really deep energy minima here for tau. Otherwise, tau would more spontaneously form these filaments, which is not what we see. So we've got a relatively flat land, um, landscape here um, as an analogy. And then we can see, we've, again, we have two minima, but the, the absolute minima in the, um, in the description of the, of the tau motion is um, here. It's at five correlation times and 36 um, nanoseconds, um, maximum 36 picoseconds minimum. And then we can then extract our residue specific information like we saw before for the Engweld. So we can, uh, so we can show how um, some residues have are subjected to much slower motions. Um, so here we've got the slow motions down here, and then we've got faster peak second motions up here. And you can see there are um, there are regions that um, have slower motion, and they correlate with our um, residual um, extended conformation that we saw. And indeed, if we highlight the region that Sophia sees in her in her fear experiment, we can see that those are the residues that are experiencing the slowest motion. So they are going to be much closer to that kind of structural environment that is seen in the fear. So it's much more likely that those two regions can interact and form a fear because they are much closer in terms of their properties than that they are in, in those filament formations. And we can then finally condense all of that information into one plot, which I think is much more easy to understand the dynamic process that are happening in our disordered system. So I think this really highlights the subtle structural and dynamic differences that we see across the primary sequence. And this is applicable to tau, but this will also be applicable to other um, ID, IDP systems. And as I said before, these regions um, highlighted in the monomeric sample correlate with the FIA region that Sophia discovered in her lovely time resolve system. So if you want to do some more reading, here are the references. And